It gives me immense pleasure in welcoming you all to the special practice seminar today. Well, the aim of the education is the knowledge, not of facts, but of values. Uh, it is an occasion like this, we get opportunities to test our knowledge and understanding. So we look forward to get an exposure about what the best of the brains think about this very dynamic issue of Brexit. Now may I request Ms. Anita Nan to give opening speech. A warm welcome to all of you to this seminar about Brexit. Your presence here is a reflection of your interest in the topic. Throughout this seminar, several business lecturers and students will discuss various issues surrounding Brexit. Brexit is a complicated issue at the present moment. It is going to affect jobs, trades, and industries, so it is an appropriate time to discuss it. Let me give a brief introduction about our guest speaker, Mr. Manoj Kankanis. He is a serial entrepreneur, managing director, and founder of Decimal Factors Limited, a finance company located on the 39th floor in a very beautiful building in Canary Wharf. Manoj has experience in marketing, financial services, extending over a decade. He also set up his own marketing company, selling photocopier machines after having worked with the reputed global giant Rank Xerox. Another important speaker is Mr. Dilip Andekar, a chartered accountant and the founder of ASTM. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Anita. I welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Monash Karkhani, CEO of Decimal Factors Limited, with a bouquet of flowers, please. Thank you very much. I also welcome our dean, Mr. Dilip Amdekar, with a bouquet of flowers, please. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Mr. Dilip Amdeka to put some light on the basic economic concepts related to Brexit. Here it goes. Good morning everybody. Good morning. I am sure you must have started very early to reach here. Yeah? So, what is the purpose basically of uh, doing this seminar? Okay, you know all these. Uh, there's a ha who going on in the parliament. Nobody sure what to do. And the Donald Tusk and from European side, they are very sure what they want, what they are doing, and we are you're lost. So, so what's what's the matter basically? First of all, especially in a country where the subject economics was born in this country. The entire subject of economics was founded from coming from Cambridge. So Cambridge University has contributed to the basically to the birth of this subject. You know, on your notes you have the pin making ability of Adam Smith. Yeah. So we, we regard economics as one of the one of the key subjects basically which this country has contributed. But then why are we confused? What's the matter? So before we start off anything, I'm going to explain to you the basic economic concepts. Because all of you are non basically non-economic students. <coughs> so how what are the terms we use? Why do we use those terms? And what do they imply? And what are the connections of each of those terms is what I'm going to explain to you. <coughs> so let me first start with economics. <coughs> what is it? Economics is the social science that studies production, distribution, consumption of goods and services, and we focus on the behavior and interactions of economic agents and how economics works. So we know that basically it looks like from this, it is science of 
what we earn, how much we spend, why we spend like that, what is our basically going to be the wealth we are creating. So it's a science basically about wealth creation. The most important definition of economics basically is this. Economics is the allocation of scarce resources among unlimited wants. You are getting to today, you are earning 2,000 pounds. How much will you spend? How much for what will you spend? Whether you will save anything? Not really. Not really? Okay. But then why are you spending that? How much will you spend on your children's education? What are your priorities? Amount is only 2,000 pounds. If you earn 20,000 pounds you get every month, then how will you spend it? The fellow who won, who won a lottery for 71 million, how will he spend his money? So, in short, the whatever do you do, whether you are mega rich or poor, everybody has got an economic problem. The wants are unlimited. I would myself like to donate, you know, for this cancer research, one billion. But I don't have one billion. Yeah. So I have got aspirations. Everybody has got aspirations. But the question is, amount of money is always limited. The resources are limited and your wants are unlimited. If you think that Bill Gates has no economic problem, it's not true. Bill Gates also has economic problem. Despite if there's so much charity, but he would like to do more. But there is no money. So, in short, now the economic problem does not arise when everything is free. If I tell you, pay for uh, for breathing air, say get lost, it's free. God has given us. But God gave water also free, but you pay for the water you get in your house, right? Because it is a scarce resource. Somebody has blocked that resource and you can't go to the river and and put a bucket and take water. So you have to pay for water now. But so there is no economic problem in breathing air because it's free. But if my lungs fail and I need high oxygen, this one, then I have to buy a cylinder for which I have to pay money. So economic problem basically arises in everything. It is a it is the science of optimization of your satisfaction. And that satisfaction is based on your perception. For somebody drinking all the drinking from say from six o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock in the morning might give him more satisfaction than eating. While for some of you, eating will give you more satisfaction, or buying good clothes will give you more satisfaction. So it's all a question of perception and what are your priorities in life. Economics is always market driven. It's the most simplest subject on the earth, to be honest. Very, very simple. You might think that uh, what did, uh, it has come from Cambridge, so it must be something which is highly intellectual. It's not like that. Everything is only related to two things. Demand and supply. What is the demand for that? What is the supply of that? That determines the price. Air is free because the supply is unlimited. Absolutely unlimited. Infinity supply. So it's free. Tomorrow, if you see gold lying all around, around everywhere, you just dig, you find gold. Gold will have no value. What is the value of gold then? It is like a stone. Do you go and buy a stone? No, you don't buy a stone. You buy, buy gold because it is scarce. Yeah? Because, the, because it is scarce, we have created a value for it. Yeah? There is a demand for it and the supply is restricted. So that's why the value goes up. Right? So it's as simple as that. It's very, very logical. So the consumer buys a product because he, he thinks. He thinks. Nobody can say sure for sure whether he's right or wrong. But he thinks that, that, that the satisfaction what he's getting is higher than the sacrifice what he's making when he's paying money from his pocket. Okay, will you buy this mic? Will you buy this mic for one pound? Yeah, all of you will buy this mic for one pound. If I say it's for 100 pounds, 
How many of you will buy? Hardly, hardly anybody. Yeah? So, the question is that because you think that this mind, when you buy for one pound, gives you more satisfaction than the, 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 the sacrifice what you can make for that one pound. While for 100 pounds, you think it's not worth buying. Correct? So, the producers, anybody who is a manufacturer, his only objective is to make a profit. If his objective is to make a profit, then the supply side, whether to supply a product or not, he will only supply the product, produce a product and supply it only when he is going to make a profit. So, here what we have is a diagram which shows the demand and supply curve. On your left hand side, you see the price in 1, 2, 3, 4 pounds. You see the supply curve. As the price goes up, at that point, when the price at that point of the supply curve, where the price is 4 pounds, you see lot of quantity he will be willing to supply. But when the price drops, if it, the price is only 1 pound, then he will only produce this much quantity. Because it is not worthwhile for him to produce that quantity. He is losing money. Why will he produce? He is not going to produce anything where he is going to lose money. That is definite. So, similarly, the demand, when the price drops, you see the price is one pound, you see on the demand curve, the demand is this much. And when the price rises, you see the demand only becomes this much. So, demand function is basically a question of the pricing. At what price will the consumer buy? It all depends on how it is marketed to it. We have told you very clearly, it's a perception. So we are not saying whether the consumer, we are assuming that the consumer is logical. We make an important assumption that the consumer thinks logically for himself. Right? Now, don't tell me that most of the people are illogical. Don't, let's not go into that because, <laughs> because we have to make some assumption and we have to make assumption that we are all logical. Now, coming to the inflation. You know, you have heard this term so many times. Oh, the price, the prices are rising in the inflation. So, what do you mean by a general price rise in every single product results in an inflation? Now, what is inflation? I'll give you a very simple example. You are 90 of you today here. Okay. For the past three days, you have not eaten anything. There was not a scrap of food you could get to eat. All of you are hungry, like hungry wolves. Now, you come here. I tell you, I've got 10 sandwiches. But all of you have got money in your pocket. All of you have got 1,000 pounds in your pocket. Each one of you has got 1,000 pounds. I, I tell you, I've got 10 sandwiches for us. What will you pay me per sandwich? You will pay whatever money you have in your pocket, you will pay. Because you are hungry. Is the price, is the true price of that sandwich in ordinary case 1000 pounds? No. But you will pay me. Why? Because number one, but you consider one thing. If I have got 10,000 sandwiches with me, so sorry. 150 sandwiches with me and quiet please and those sandwiches are going to go waste after 5 o'clock today then the pressure is on me to sell you will come and tell me that uh, oh you got 150 sandwiches uh, we know that they are going to go waste today why don't you sell it for 50 pence now I have bought the sandwich myself for a pound right so I will be compelled to sell it to you for 50 pence because you are only 90 people and I have got 150 sand sandwiches. Right? So, what you have got a lot of money in your pocket. So, what happens is that when there is too much money and the goods are too few, then the prices just go up. Because there is a shortage of supply. There is a shortage of real goods and services. 
and the amount of money you have is plenty. So you are willing to pay more and more to get those, to buy those services. As a result of which the prices go higher and higher. Now, what happens when the prices go higher and higher? When the prices go higher and higher, the poor people find it very difficult. What will they do? Not all of the, you might be earning X amount of money, there is somebody earning more money. So we will be willing to pay more price for that. So the rich people will get all what they want and the poor people will die. So inflation is very bad for poor people. Inflation is very bad for people, for old people like me who have saved something for their retirement. What is the value of money? Tomorrow, if, if I have to buy a sandwich for a thousand pounds, my money won't last me for 10 days or 100 days. That's all. That's all what the money what, what, what will last me. So in short, inflation is a monetary situation where the money supply is too much. And as a result of too much money supply, the prices go high. In the case of deflation, it is exactly the opposite. What happens is that the prices start falling. Once the prices start falling in the market, they reach such a stage where the producer thinks it is not profitable to produce it. If it is not pro profitable to produce it, the producer will stop producing it. So what will happen when the producer stops producing it? Now, you are employed by your company. The producer stops producing. He tells you to go home. No salary for you? No salary for you means what? You stop buying goods. You will tell your children, no, you want uh, more clothes? No, no, I want no money to buy. <coughs> Just basic food, water, no, nothing else. So you will start reducing your consumption. When you start reducing your consumption, the people who are employed in the clothing industry, where you are buying the goods, their demand goes down, their the redundancies occur. So those people will get unemployed in turn, and then the cycle goes on and on and on. See, once the speed gathers, then the cycle just goes on till the time, yeah, chain reaction till the time it comes back to the reverse thing. Then somebody suddenly wakes up. Hey, what the hell is happening? We need to start consuming. The government says, "Come on, let's." pump money into the economy when, the, when there is a deflation and let's start increasing the consumption. Actually, the consumption of, in our UK economy has been buoyant because of the money being pumped, and pumped in during the last few years. So, both the deflation, in a deflation what happens is this. You, you must have seen in 1930s there was a big depression in America where millions and millions of people were unemployed. You can imagine people like you, him, me, wearing a, wearing a, this one, placard on our chest, unemployed, please employers. And millions of people like that being unemployed. So what happens is it causes distress. It causes suicides, it causes unhappiness in the society. It ruins the entire society. So, so inflation as well as deflation, both are ruinous for the society. So here I have drawn a chart to show that the, that the price level basically, the output remains the same and just the money supply goes up. And you know, inflation and, and deflation, is like your body temperature. Your body temperature, how much is your body temperature? 97.87? 97.8? Now, if that goes up, you say you have got a fever. That's called inflation. <coughs> and if it starts going down, then you die. Then, then also you die <laughs> because you're cold. So, in short, you know, the body temperature has to be maintained. So the scene has to be, the economic scene has to be, there should be neither an inflation nor a depression. But 
the whole economy works in cycles. Once there is the inflation, there is up, 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 and then it starts going down, 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 and then again when it reaches the trough, it starts climbing up. So the job of the government is to see that there is neither inflation or deflation in the economy and try to take measures to prevent it. Now, I've given a chart of inflation in the UK here. In 2011, the inflation rate was 4.5%. And, and the interest rate in the UK was half a percent. When I came to this country in 1991, the base interest rate, this is the base interest rate, this is charged by the central bank of the country to lend money to all the other banks. When I came in 1991, the interest rate prevailing year was 15%. 1.5. Now you look at it. Suppose at that time, I had 500,000 pounds. Yeah? The average salary in the country was 22, 23,000 pounds. If I had 500,000 pounds in the bank account, and if I keep it at 15% interest, I earn 75,000 pounds a year. I think I'm very, very rich. I should retire immediately. Yeah? But then, with a 500,000 pound and a half a percent interest, you'll get 2,500 pounds. So, in short, the interest rate affects two, two people. Number one is the savers in the economy. Those who do not want to take a risk and invest in the bank savings. If their income, if the interest rates are low, then it is very difficult for them to survive. And interest also affects the people who borrow money. If the, if the interest rate is high, then I think two times before investing money because I need to go to the bank and if I'm borrowing it, if I have to borrow 500,000 pounds and pay 75,000 pounds a year in interest, that means I must earn at least 200, 300,000 pounds in order to pay the 75,000 pound interest and make some profit for me, right? But today, if I'm borrowing money, 500,000 pounds, and I'm paying interest of 2,500 pounds, then it's as simple as that. So, anybody who is willing to invest because the interest rate is low. The investment function depends on the interest rate because the interest rates are low. Lower the interest rate, higher the investment comes in. But lower the interest rate, the, the retired people and people living on what you call fixed income suffer. Now let us come to the term, what is gross domestic product, GDP. Gross domestic product basically is the monetary value of all the finished goods and services produced in the country. So the sum total of everything what is produced in the country is the GDP. This reflects, in my terms, I'll tell you, this reflects the size of the cake. How big is the cake? Because this cake is shared between all of us. This cake, the bigger the size of the economy, bigger the output, that means there is more money, there is more income in the country, and that is shared between all of us. So, the size of the cake is what GDP is. What does it consist of? It consists of the following. The government spending, the net exports, the personal consumption, and the business investment. The money which a company earns can be spent in two ways. Either it is expense. Expense means what? They pay all of you a salary. Now, that salary goes into your pockets. Then you start spending money out of that. But the profits what the company makes, out of that profit, the company invests money into buying more machinery. Because of more machinery, they are able to produce more. When you buy more machinery, when you make the investment, you will employ more people. You have got one machine today, you have got five machines, you employ five times more people. Right? Simple as that. So, the investment and the employment has got a relationship. Correct? 
The more you invest, the more people you will employ. At the end of the day, what are we looking for? All of you have come here from Romania, not to sit idly, but to go for jobs and earn money. All of you want employment. Is anybody sitting at home here? Nobody, no, none of you are sitting at home. All of you are working all the time to earn money. So fundamentally, employment is very, very important. <coughs> Unemployed people means idle resources. Anything which lies idle is wasteful, right? So these are the few relationships which I wanted to, to to put in your brains because what happens is that you are not economic students and you are business students, you are studying business, but business has got a relationship with economics. But during your course, for your course, you have not selected economics as one of your subjects because, because you have got other subjects like marketing, finance um, and HR and so many other subjects to deal with. Another important point is this. You get a salary of 2,000 pounds. How fast is the salary growing? That is the most important thing. How much? Whether you get an increment of 400 pounds every year per month, you, or you are getting an increment of 25 pounds. That is very important. So how fast is your GDP? The total size of the crate growing at what speed? You see, you see the running, uh, the, the gymnastic races. There are some people who gather speed right from the start. There are some people who gather speed at the middle or, the, or towards the end. So it's very important at what speed the economy is growing at. What, is, what speed your GDP is growing at? In the year 1980. China was a pretty poor country, was very poor. China has maintained from that date an average GDP growth, growth rate of 10%, while the GDP growth rate in all the other European countries was about 1.5%. As a result, when China was right down the bottom, now they have come fairly at the top. Because since 1980 till today, that is for 37 years, they have grown at 10% per annum and they are catching up on it. Look at how fast Romania is growing. <laughs> look, look at the rate. It is true, Romania is growing at a very fast rate very fast rate and it is catching up because it has to see why is it happening like that because it has to do a catch up why because you people are coming from Romania here earning your money and spending it in Romania back <laughs> is that not true it is true yeah it is true so naturally the investment will happen in your country and the more the investment happens naturally so there will be a higher growth. As simple as that. Right? Okay. Coming, coming to the GDP of the countries, okay? The United States GDP is number one. 20 trillion, 412 billion. Yeah? And everybody is, of course, followed by China now. But remember one thing, this GDP on, the, on this side, the green side of the chart, is the actual figure of GDP, that is the dollar earnings of people. On the other side, you see the GDP which is written in PPP. PPP is the purchasing power parity. I will explain you what is the meaning of purchasing power parity. Now, Tomorrow, in, you go back to Romania and you start earning 2,000 pounds in Romania. How much can you buy goods and services in Romania for 2,000 pounds? A lot. Can you buy that much in UK here? No. Because the prices are higher. 
So, are you just because the, the amount is the same, 2,000 pounds, but you are more richer in Romania because the prices, the, uh, what you can buy with that is much, you can buy many more goods and services because the prices are low. Right? So, how rich you are does not only depend on how much money you have in real in real currency, but also on the prices what are prevailing in the market. If I go back to India and if I have got an income of say 5,000 pounds, I can live like a king, absolutely like a king, because the prices are low. I can employ so many servants, I can do this, I can do that. But when I live here, it's not good enough because three and a half thousand of that goes to pay the mortgage. Yeah. So the purchasing power parity is if United States is one, the prices in India are 3.646 times lower than the as compared to the prices in United States. So when you adjust that you see that India had a per capita income. Uh, you see the total GDP of India, 2.8 billion. It becomes 10 billion 385. The another important thing is how many people are sharing the GDP. I got I got a cake of this big five kilo cake. But if all 90 people are sharing that cake, you will only receive a small size slice. So, I need to get a 10 kilo cake, right? For you to get a bigger slice, right? The same thing. In India, we have got 1.2 billion people. So, 1.2 billion people are sharing the 10 billion. Why? In the UK, only 60 million are sharing. How many people does Romania have? 19 million. So, let's face it. A country which has got a smaller population, yeah, the per capita, which is the money available per person, will definitely be higher. Yeah, and that determines how rich each individual is. Which are the richest countries who have in per person highest income? Of course, Luxembourg, because they have got only few hundred thousand people there, and everybody goes and deposits their money in Luxembourg, so they have got huge money available. So that is why they are the richest, followed by Switzerland. You, when, when you have a lot of money, whichever way, illegal way, then you go and deposit it in the Swiss banks. So that is how the Swiss earn their money. You buy chocolates which are Swiss, you buy watches which are Swiss. So Switzerland is a rich country because its income is so high compared to the population. So per person. Each person is earning $86,000. That means even a small child, you are taking that into account as well. So, if you have a family of four, you are earning $320,000 plus for indirect investment. This is the investment made into the country by foreigners. Now, you know very well how many people now after the EU, Romania joined the EU, all the German companies, etc., must have invested in Romania, right? Why? Because the prices are low. Why is it an attractive place to produce? Because you can produce at a cheaper price than in Germany. Now, the most important thing is that Britain in the entire world is number two country, number two, just followed by America which attracts the highest foreign direct investment. Now, after Brexit, what happens to that? We don't know. We'll, we'll examine that. Yeah? The foreign direct investments into the UK have fallen by almost 20% since, since the EU referendum. Since the referendum, the UK has experienced the sharpest decline in overseas investments since the record began. Germany owed to UK last year to become the European country receiving the most foreign investment. If the goods are not going to move smoothly between UK and Europe and there are uncertainties, then people will stop investing.
will say, let us wait and watch. Let us come to a conclusion only after we know what is happening. No investment means no more jobs being created. And the country GDP stagnates. As you can see, United Kingdom was number two in terms of in terms of the investments made in the country from abroad. Now, how are the, what are the sources of investment, basically? The sources of investment are savings, borrowings, deficit finance, foreign investment, ex and direct investment. So, because of Brexit, all of this is going to get affected. S excess savings. Excess savings can result in lower consumption, but can trigger deflation and unemployment. Deficit financing. I've told you already that when the government just prints notes and puts them into the market, then what happens? There is too much money, the prices go up, people become poor. The high interest rates promote savings, but they, they make investments difficult. The value of pound is what we call the currency depreciation <coughs> or the currency devaluation. You know very well, all of you send money to Romania. Now you get less and less Romanian currency for your pound <coughs> as compared with Brexit before Brexit. Foreign trade. You know what is the meaning of export? You export goods and services to others. You sell goods and services to others. Yeah? And imports, you buy goods and services from other countries. A trade surplus or a trade deficit results as in when you start selling to a country and buying from a country. If you sell more to a country, then you've got a surplus. If you sell less to a country, then what you buy from them, you've got a deficit. UK's largest trading partners, of course, are European Union is number one, and that is the crux of the matter. Our largest trading partner is EU, by a huge, huge margin. A fiscal deficit occurs when the government's total expenditure exceeds the revenue. Deficit differs from debt, which is accumulation of yearly deficits. The reasons for the deficit, you, you spend too much money on defense, you spend poor performance of the economy, of the public sector organizations, tax evasion, people don't pay taxes, the borrowings are big, you pay more interest. What has been the impact of what you call a crunch going on? And they are saving on everything. The total number of people employed in the government has fallen. Everybody's salaries were frozen for three years. Basically, because of that, the government spending more money than what it is collecting taxes has now fallen from a high of 103 billion to nearly zero. To nearly zero. More than 100 billion have been shaved off. But that is the reason why you see that there are no policemen on the road. There are knife crimes. Because the public services have been going down and down and down. There is a big cut in the expenditure. The national debt of the country is very high. What is the national debt? The total debt made by the government. And of course, the total that does not include the total debt of the people. The people in this country are also borrowing large amounts of money large amounts of money. The total borrowing per person, per person, excluding the mortgage borrowing, is nearly 16,000 pounds per person. And that they are borrowing unsecured at high interest rate. And that is growing all the time. Why? Because the government is cutting the expenses. The Money paid to the people who are living off what you call don't is going lower and lower. So they have to resort to borrowings. The UK unemployment rates are currently one of the lowest, probably the lowest in the entire Europe. 
when you when you come here, you easily find a job. It's not so easy. You go to Spain. Why are you not going to Spain? Already 10% of the people are unemployed there. Fine, they have not got a job themselves. Why will they want you to come there? Right? It's very difficult to find a job in most of the European countries. Italy, very, very high unemployment. But compared to that, Britain is doing very well. It has got a very, very low unemployment rate. So unemployment basically happens because of the cycles of inflation, deflation. It also happens because the, the quality of training is poor in the country. And you don't find people to do specialist jobs, then those positions go vacant. So these are the main you know, economic concepts which I want you to consider while you are examining Brexit. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for your valuable insights about the basic economic concepts.